we're gonna get started. All right, okay. uh, we're just gonna get started. Uh, first of all, thanks to Kathleen for preaching twice and leading adult forum. Yeah. Uh, that's a lot for anybody, so thank you, Kathleen, for all the work you put in your sermon and the presentation. And uh, and welcome to our, our fourth in this uh, this great series. So thanks to again to Kathleen, thanks to our RIC team, um, our advocacy team, and the adult day coordination team. Thanks, thanks for being here. <laughs> Dottie, do you have anything before we just take over? Yeah. All right. <laughs> and a welcome, a second welcome, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. All right, Dorothy. Read. <laughs> Let's pray. Here we are once more, Lord wanting to learn and understand so that we can better serve all of your people. We know that our lives are not always fair. We know that many suffer from a number of inequalities, but we also know that kindness and devotion and knowledge are powerful tools and conditions that you have given to us. Let us be diligent and committed to using these and be all that you have created us to be. Amen. You're on. <coughs> Daddy. Um, yeah, so I think you all know me. I'm Kathleen. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I This is the fourth in our um, series uh, put together by the RIC and advocacy teams. So I'm super grateful to all of the members of both of those teams um, for putting this together and supporting me in um, presenting. And um, several members of both teams are here today. So as we go through um, this conversation and, you know, moving forward, um, if there are questions or like you want to continue these conversations, right, this is the end of the series, but not the end of these conversations. Um, so you can always come talk to me or to Keith, but also to members of the RIC and advocacy teams. Um, so Aaron is your point person for the advocacy team and Chris Lu or Fred Loomis, rather, who's on the screen and Ailey DiMattista are the um, chairs for RIC, but there are many other members of both teams. So um, you show hands. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, show of uh, hands R. for R. RIC R. and advocacy. Yeah. R. For which? R. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't plan this part. <laughs> and advocacy, amazing, great, super. Um, so today um, we're talking about intersectionality and marginalization. Um, as you can see, you already have some advocacy opportunities listed that are related to intersectional justice issues. Those sheets are going around. Um, we're also going to use the back of that sheet as a blank sheet of paper briefly. Um, so just if you don't have a piece of paper, if there aren't quite enough for everyone, um, be aware. We, we can find more paper. Um, but with that, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, and so I will have slides on the screen. Those of you who are on Zoom, if you can get a scratch piece of scratch paper and a pen um, for, a, for a very brief thing later, and these advocacy opportunities uh, will be listed on the Adult Forum resources page. <laughs> I think that is, those are all the housekeeping things. Um, okay. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> Um, so first things first, these are two big words that we maybe don't always do a great job of defining um, when we have these conversations. So marginalization, um, most simply, is when a person or a group is pushed aside, so pushed to the margins by the power brokers of society. So there are lots of different people and groups um, that are marginalized by our society because um, one group tends to be centered and anyone who doesn't fit the mold that society centers yeah. then is marginalized. Um, so that's a very, very brief sort of oversimplified definition, but just to get us started. Um, and these are some identity categories that um, a person might claim that might lead them to be either centered or marginalized. 
So any of these category, identity categories or status labels might be a space of marginalization. So for instance, in our society, able bodies are prioritized or centered, meaning that disabled people are marginalized. Um, being straight and cisgender is prioritized by society, meaning that having an LGBTQIA plus identity is marginal. Um, so although there's been a great deal of progress over the years in the direction of civil rights to marginalized people, our society is still structured in such a way that certain types of people are centered. Um, so very briefly, that very simple, simplified definition of marginalization. Are there any questions before I move on to intersectionality? We will obviously like the whole hour. We're going to be talking about both these concepts, but just on level of definitions or concepts, are there any questions? Is there any uh, significance to the size of the circles on that? Oh it's no, random. it's just an image. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's just an image that I found on the internet. I didn't. I didn't even think of that. Very astute question. Um, no, these are these are just categories that might lead us to be um, either centered or marginalized, right? And you can see that some of them aren't necessarily like fixed identity categories, right? Um, things like personality um, is not you know, a social identifier, but it might be something that leads a person to be ostracized. Mm -hmm. um, so some of them are sort of more core to a person's being than others. Um, mm -hmm. So in that way, there is like maybe some difference, like maybe this, this image maybe could be a little bit more precise, but um, any other questions? All right. Um, so intersectional, theory, so intersectionality is the other big term then, right? An intersectional theory grew out of, mo <clears throat> excuse me, grew out of a movement of black women. And the term was coined by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw. So this is an excerpt from a TED talk that Dr. Crenshaw gave explaining her experience with intersectional marginalization. And we're gonna watch just like a brief clip from this TED talk because she explains it better than I ever could. Oh, I need, hang on, I need to share sound. I forgot this last time too. Can you see okay? Nope, that's still not working. Uh, we might have to <coughs> Sorry. So it says I'm muted. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Oh. <laughs> it's off. <laughs> Nothing comes. So I tried unmuting and I tried turning my sound on, and neither of those makes the video sound work. The audio in here. Yep. On the no. Oh, yeah, the sure. audio is on. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think. Can you maybe you need to rejoin without audio? That, oh, that there's something yeah. else that you've got uh, to say. Did, have you run it from there before? Yes. Yes, you have. Okay. Um, there's another something when you join Zoom, I think, to allow. Hang on, I just found one more setting. Let me try something else. Mm -hmm. That many of our social. Yeah. All right. Many years ago, I began to use the term intersectionality. No. Nope. That many of our social justice problems, like race. All right, we're going to try that again, and I'm very sorry. Many years ago, I began to use the term intersectionality to deal with the fact that many of our social justice problems like racism and sexism are often overlapping, creating multiple levels of social injustice. Now, the experience that gave rise to intersectionality was my chance encounter with a woman named Emma de Graffenried. Emma de Graffenried was an African-American woman, a working wife, and a mother. I actually read about Emma's story from the pages of a legal opinion written by a judge who had dismissed Emma's claim of race and gender discrimination against a local 
car manufacturing plant. Emma, like so many African-American women, sought better employment for her family and for others. She wanted to create a better life for her children and for her family. But she applied for a job, and she was not hired, and she believed that she was not hired because she was a black woman. Now, the judge in question dismissed Emma's suit. And the argument for dismissing the suit was that the employer did hire African Americans, and the employer hired women. The real problem, though, that the judge was not willing to acknowledge was what Emma was actually trying to say, that the African Americans that were hired, usually for industrial jobs, maintenance jobs, were all men. And the women that were hired, usually for secretarial or, or front office work, were all white. Only if the court was able to see how these policies came together would he be able to see the double discrimination that Emma de Graffenried was facing. But the court refused to allow Emma to put two causes of action together to tell her story because he believed that by allowing her to do that, she would be able to have preferential treatment. She'd have an advantage by being able to have two swings at the bat when African-American men and white women only had one swing at the bat. But, of course, neither African-American men or white women needed to combine a race and gender discrimination claim to tell the story of the discrimination they were experiencing. Why wasn't the real unfairness law's refusal to protect African-American women simply because their experiences weren't exactly the same as white women and African-American men. Rather than broadening the frame to include African-American women, the court simply tossed their case completely out of court. Now, as a student of anti-discrimination law, as a feminist, as an anti-racist, I was struck by this case. It, it, it felt to me like Injustice squared. So, so first of all, black women weren't allowed to work at the plant. Second of all, the court doubled down on this exclusion by making it legally inconsequential. And to boot, there was no name for this problem. And we all know that where there's no name for a problem, you can't see a problem. And when you can't see a problem, you pretty much can't solve it. Many years later, I'd, I'd come to recognize that the problem that Emma was facing was a framing problem. The frame that the court was using to see gender discrimination or to see race discrimination was partial, and it was distorting. For me, the, the challenge that I faced was trying to figure out whether there was an alternative narrative, a prism, that would allow us to see Emma's dilemma, a, a prism that would allow us to rescue her from the cracks in the law, that would allow judges to see her story. So it occurred to me, maybe a, a, a simple analogy to an intersection might allow judges to better see Emma's dilemma. So if we think about this intersection, the roads to the intersection would be the way that the workforce was structured by race and by gender. And then the traffic in those roads would be the hiring policies and, and the other practices that ran through those roads. Now, because Emma was both black and female, she was positioned precisely where those roads overlapped, experiencing the simultaneous impact of the company's gender and race traffic. So, oh. many years ago, uh, so as Emma's story demonstrates, it's often the experience of individuals and communities that 
raise awareness about social injustices. So Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw was part of Black feminist movements, um, but until she met Emma, uh, intersectional theory wasn't part of her legal analysis. Um, she's a legal theorist. Um, so it's the experiences of individuals that lead to these sort of understandings of social injustice. And in their book, Intersectional Theology, Grace G. Soon Kim and Susan M. Shaw explain that intersectional theology too is contextual. It begins in the stories of those who are doing the theologizing. So today we are going to do a little bit of theologizing, or if you were here two weeks ago, we might borrow Pastor L's um, language using our spiritual imagination. Um, and we're gonna do that together using our own stories. So on your paper, we're just gonna take like a brief minute for you to think to yourself. And if you're a, an internal thinker, you can do it in your brain. And if you're an external processor and writing is helpful to you, it is for me. Um, that's why I, you have paper and pens. Um, use this graphic as a sort of jumping off point. Use this graphic as a jumping off point to list your identities and life experiences that shape the way you interact with the world. So on the screen, you have examples, but there are certainly other areas that you might think of from your own life. Um, and it's worth noting that none of these are binary. They're not necessarily divided into neat categories. Um, so for instance, you might've been raised working class, but you now identify as middle class. And so both of those categories might shape your interactions with the world. Um, you might have an interfaith family and that shapes the way you interact with the world. Um, so that, um, so, so you don't have to fit yourself neatly into boxes in any of these categories, but just think about how your identities and life experiences um, in these categories shape your, the way you uh, go about day to day. Just take a minute to do that and then we're gonna chat. <laughs> So you can certainly keep working as we talk. Um, I don't expect that that was enough time to reflect on your entire life. Um, but I, I want us to take those personal reflections and discuss them. Um, of course, this can be personal and um, maybe a little bit sensitive. So this is all challenged by choice as always. Um, only share as you feel comfortable. Um, but in Emma DeGroff and Reed's case that we heard about from Dr. Crenshaw, her race and gender intersected to affect her life experience in a particular way. So now I want you to think about the identities that you listed um, and ask yourself, and if you're willing to share, please share, do any of the identities you listed build on, complicate, or nuance each other? Do any of them intersect in ways that um, affect the way that you interact with the world differently than somebody who might share one of those identities but not the other? Say the last part again. So do any of the identities that you listed intersect in ways that might affect, um, sorry, my words aren't working, that might affect somebody else? No. What did I say? Do any of your, the identities that you listed intersect, like our example earlier of being Black and being a woman, in ways 
to affect you in ways that they might not affect somebody who only has one of those identities. Right. So that a black woman has a different experience than white women or than black men, right? So those two identities intersect. Yeah, I don't remember if I'm answering your question. That's okay. Go get started. Yeah. Okay. Um, as a person who I feel that my religion was very important mm -hmm. in my life, my um, relationship with God mm -hmm. is very important to me. As a public school teacher, this created problems for me mm -hmm. because it. I certainly wasn't well, obviously you no, know, I wasn't allowed to talk about God and religion mm -hmm. as it. Except that I go to a Lutheran school. Mm -hmm. That was such a freedom, freedom for me. But mm -hmm. in the in the public school, I couldn't. Do you want me to go on or do you hear it out? No, that's a great example. I, I didn't, I don't mean to stop you. If you have more to say, oh, so I, I do it but... for a long time. But... <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that, that's an example, certainly, of a way that a particular identity affected you. Mm -hmm. um, it was hard. Yeah. How about for others? Um, do any of your identities build on, complicate, or nuance each other? I have fun. Yeah. Um, as it turned out, I. Even though I got scholarships, I had to work my way through school. Mm -hmm. So money was very important. Mm -hmm. And one of the best jobs I could get was in a factory. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was politely and not so politely told that being a woman, I could not do this job. Mm -hmm. And I was given a two week trial mm -hmm. where at different times I was first, I was sabotaged, but I rose above it. And I wish I had phones we have today so I could take some pictures. Mm -hmm. But I had to convince them that my femininity mm -hmm. had nothing to do with my physicality mm -hmm. or my mental ability. Mm -hmm. And I was the only woman working there. And that was another issue. They mm -hmm. felt that it would just not work. So that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Simple. And this is many years ago, I went to a timeshare thing. Stupidly. <laughs> um, and uh, at the end, of course, they try to pressure you into buying something. But when they found out that I was single mm -hmm. and I wasn't married, mm -hmm. they didn't really, you know, because I just what I didn't make enough money, I was a woman. And I said, Well, I've been single all my life and I, I make very decent money and I can afford this. And then my friend that was with me. She was married, but because her husband wasn't with her, they weren't interested in her. And they 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 were very well off and she ran a whole business. But I found that because I was single, they didn't want any parts of me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So there's this like ideal subject is the language that sometimes gets used um in social analysis. The ideal subject is a straight, cisgender, white. Protestant man who's wealthy. Um, he's married. He has, you know, two <laughs> he's sitting next to me. Um, and, but you own that. Yeah, that's true. And, and, and so whether um, whether we have one identity that is different from the ideal subject or multiple, um, you know, each of those is. Each of those complicates our experience. So yeah, not being married. I looked at one more thing. Yeah, I had a girlfriend that ended up after a couple marriages getting married again, and we were at a party, and she turned around and introduced us to some of her friends, and she said, "Oh, this is my single friend. <laughs> <laughs> not, this is just my friend. Yeah. This is my single friend. Absolutely, <laughs> shame on you." <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, absolutely. Yeah, I fall into your whatever that's called. Ideal subject, yeah. <laughs> but I'm married to somebody that's not. Yeah. You know, so uh, Jenny, like the woman, she's Jewish. In this country, she's an immigrant. She has a green card. You know, so um, so it's been a real learning experience for me being married to somebody that has a lot of you know intersection intersectionality and what what that means for her and her experience. Um, and then what that means for us as a family. So she's really helped me to be myself better. Than, you know, the world yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Immigration status is one I hadn't mentioned. Immigration status is another one that can really cause problems.
problems for people. Um, yeah. Even when you're Canadian. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and white and well educated right. and all the things. Yeah, absolutely. Still, yeah, those the, darn Canadians. Yeah. You know, and, uh, they walk, they walk among us. Uh, yeah, I have, I have a cousin who's married to a Polish citizen and she's white and is working on a PhD. And so, like, all of the things that make the ideal immigrant. Um, she still can't, she cannot get a green card. She, they, they, aren't, they aren't able to live here. Um, and it's easier for him to live in Poland than it is for her to live here. So um, yeah, there's lots of, <laughs> it's very complicated. Um, any other like sort of thoughts about that? I, my next, the next slide is another discussion question. So don't worry, we're not done talking, but I, if there are sort of burning thoughts about this one, I wanna leave space for them. All right, oh but, yes. I mean, I, I just thought it was interesting that you have hobbies as mm. one of the things, and it is true, you know, like most, especially here in the U.S., you got to be a sports fan. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody's got a sports. Yeah, they're hobby. normalized. And hobby. if you're um, really into birding, especially if you're a male birder or something like that, <laughs> I mean, that's kind of like oh, or if you're nerdy and you just really enjoy history or chemistry or something else. And I just thought, you know, it's something we don't think of, but mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. It's it's and really it's, interesting that you named birding as your example because we saw an example in the news last year of a black birder who was threatened in Central Park for, for loitering when he was really just looking at birds. Um, and and if a white woman yeah. had been doing the exact same activity, the, the situation might not have been the same, or a white man for that matter. Um, although, yeah, we have sort of gendered some of our hobbies in weird ways. Um, so for those of you, well, whether you do or you don't hold intersectional identities that affect your interactions with the world, think about someone you love that you know well, who holds two different, who holds different social identities than you in at least two categories. For instance, he shared about Jenny, right? He knows her social identities that differ from his own and he's learned from her. Um, so think about someone you know who holds different identities than you in at least two categories. And, and when you have that person in mind, I wonder how might those identities build on, complicate, or nuance each other differently than your own? I have a friend who, uh, who is a CEO, female, mm -hmm. uh, lesbian. Mm -hmm and has repeatedly in the course of her life, and that's how she identifies her, mm -hmm. um, has had to navigate or justify who she is mm -hmm. rather than what she has produced. And let's look at that and make judgments that that's your thing. Before the judgments even get to that point, they're using her, who she is, and I, I just wanted to say some of these things, we have no control over changing. We were created like this by a loving God who loves us. So we ask sometimes of, of people to change who God has created. They're just to be accepted, but, but she battles that every single day in the conference. Yeah, absolutely. I got one. Yeah. Um, my former minister, mm. she was black, gay, and divorced. Mm. So, and and uh, what a great minister she was. But uh, it was a very different. She had been married. She had been gay. She was an educator. She became a minister, a principal minister, and uh, that's a lot of differences. Yeah. 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 And in the church and in the workplace are two major places that we see these things playing out. Um, so those are both great examples. Yeah, um, I um, know a, a young mother, a teenage mom, she's black. She has a child with a physical disability. And um, I kind of alluded to this a few weeks back when Pastor L was here. She recently had to go to our nationally esteemed local children's hospital. Mm -hmm. um, for a cardiology appointment, and this little girl is very, very underweight due to a variety of reasons. Um, the reasons do not include that her mother is not caring adequately for her. But when she went to see this cardiologist, the first question he asked her was, are you feeding her? Like, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. And just 
the absolute conviction that if that were me in there with my mm -hmm. kid, you mm -hmm. never in a million years. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So medical to me. Yep. There's another sure. Yeah, I'll um so I'll share an example from my family. Um so I have an aunt who's lesbian and her wife is black and their adopted daughter is also black. And um so they go through the world very differently than the rest of my family. Um, and in particular, uh, there was a Thanksgiving, I don't know, five or six years ago, that we're all sitting around the table and my aunt looks at her siblings and goes, okay, I'm just, I'm just curious. Anybody else have high blood pressure? Like I've been told I have high blood pressure. You all share all my genes. Like, is this genetic or is it something else? And all her siblings said, I don't know what you're talking about. None of us have that problem. And so the conclusion then was that she experiences social pressures, um, just going around in the world being who she is and in particular protecting her family that other people in our family don't, don't experience. Um, and it manifests in her health. And then sort of the, the response of her doctor was like, it's probably genetic. And she confirmed that it's not, and her doctor didn't believe her that these social situations were um, adversely affecting her health. And um, and, and her wife uh, works at St. Olaf. Many of you may know St. Olaf is a very white Lutheran college. Um, and she constantly gets tokenized as this black woman, this black queer woman professor, um, you know, to like educate the rest of the campus community about her intersecting identities. Um, so they, yeah, they, they go through life very differently than, you know, my, my parents and my other aunts and uncles do, um, even though they share a lot of their, a, a lot of other things in common. Yeah. So um, you all know, uh, well, most of you know Nelson Rivera, mm. who's presented here as a good friend of the country. We had coffee the other day, and I'll, kind of along those lines, you know, he's port, uh, from Puerto Rico, and um, he teaches at Meridian College, which is very white. So he is on every committee <laughs> because they want the committees to be diverse. So like that's a good thing, you know. He's on, they're on he's on professor search committees. He's you know he's on every he's on all these committees because he's a person of color. Right. And so he was telling me all these things that he's doing, and it just sounded it was just like exhausting. You know, he's like the nicest. He's the yeah. nicest man. Yeah. But I just thought, you know, yeah, he's kind of doing this work on our behalf, you know, so in, in one sense, he was saying, I'm glad to be in the room and to help, but I'm exhausted and I still have to teach and, and do all that. Yeah. But I bet he's not compensated for all that traditional work. Yeah, right, yeah. right, right. Yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. So I wish we could keep talking about this. There are so many, so many examples, um, but there are a couple other things I want to make sure we hit. Um, so another lens that we might use to conceptualize intersectionality is that of relationality. Um, so that might be a word that's more familiar or makes you, helps you think about this in a different way. Um, so I'm just gonna read, uh, oh, it's on the screen. I don't have to read it, but I will also read it. Sorry, I forgot I was looking at two different screens. Um, so this is an excerpt from a book called Intersectionality. It's by Patricia Hill Collins and Surma Bilge. Um, and so they explain relational thinking rejects either or binary thinking, for example, opposing theory to practice, scholarship to act activism, or black to white. Instead, relationality embraces a both and frame. So if you remember, Dr. Crenshaw said it's a framing problem. Mm -hmm. So here we're, we're adopting a new frame. The focus of relationality shifts from analyzing what distinguishes entities, for instance, the differences between race and gender, to examine their interconnections. And this shift in perspective opens up intellectual and political possibilities. Apparently the quote in my notes is different than the one on the screen, but there you go. Um, and the good news for us in this room is that you've probably been exposed to relational frameworks before because both and thinking is very, very Lutheran. Um, so Austin Hartke is a Lutheran theologian who is a trans man, and he explains when you talk about Jesus as both fully God and fully human, it breaks apart the idea of a binary. 
somehow Jesus is 200%. <laughs> and when you're talking about Luther's both and of saint and sinner, if you're not familiar, this is a very famous Luther quote. He says, we are all simultaneously justified and sinner. It erases the line between these categories of saint and sinner. And the paradox that we are then left with is that we are both, we are all fully both things. So God or Jesus is fully God and fully human. We are fully saint and fully sinner. It means that these dividing lines we've created don't serve us when we talk about God and they don't serve us when we talk about ourselves. Um, so with that in mind, how could a framework that is both intersectional and Lutheran liberate and empower our ongoing processes and widening our welcome? What do you think? <laughs> how, could, how could a framework that is both intersectional and Lutheran 200% um, liberate and empower our process of widening our welcome? When we continue these conversations, how could this framework empower and inform those conversations? What do y'all think? The key word is permission. Mm. Giving ourselves permission to be who we are, mm -hmm. whether it's however you want to label it, I am more than what you see. Mm -hmm. We are all more than yeah. what we see. Mm -hmm. And to give ourselves permission is empowering. Mm -hmm. It's also empowering to take ownership of ourselves, whether it's mistakes or, or values or, or skills that we have. So to give ourselves permission to be who we are mm -hmm. is the most liberating Thing that we can do. I think anyway. <laughs> yeah. What else? What do you all think? We're using our spiritual imagination. Yeah. <laughs> We're dreaming. You know, like something that you could slide when you're talking about uh, when you have when that loved one is uh, mm, sorry, I can't I can't understand understand what you're saying this. <laughs> when a loved one has different ideas. Yeah. And it talks about nuances and yeah. just those things. And I think um, that's where the little, where I think we could widen our welcome if we would embrace those differences mm -hmm. or be able to empower us. Absolutely. We're still working on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not to see them as threats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's and a not difference. to see them as tokenism. Right. Yeah. I mean, if, you know, we all want to do the right thing, yeah. but sometimes we objectify it. Who's different? Just yeah. to say that, oh, okay. Absolutely. I Absolutely. Yeah. That's, That's such an important point. How about when we say my black friend? We have to say my Irish friend or my Lithuanian friend. And we say my black friend. I hear it. Why are you doing that? George mm -hmm. wants to say oh. something. Oh, yes. Hello, George. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to say that maybe the both end is like when we know that the Christian church hasn't been welcoming. You know, our both end could be that we are we are a Christian church, and we are welcoming. You know that that in in and of itself could be like a revelation that's not widely <laughs> believed. <laughs> that shouldn't it shouldn't be like a paradox, but sometimes it is. It, right, right. <laughs> yeah, Aaron, uh, George. <laughs> so, in terms of widening our welcome, and um, you know, I, I'm thinking about how churches tend to operate, um, how people are called to committees, how we hire staff, how we structure ourselves is often started with a presumption of who someone is and what role they may fill. But I think in doing this exercise, we see that we all see ourselves as having so many more identities than you can see on the surface mm -hmm. and that we need to maybe do a better job of of helping people to express who they feel that they are and what they feel they would bring mm -hmm. to different situations rather than saying you look good for this job <laughs> you look good for that committee come on get in here you know how do we do a better job at allowing people to tell mm -hmm. us who they are mm -hmm. and where they might serve or be a part of things? yeah mm -hmm. that's a great idea absolutely other thoughts mm -hmm. Just to piggyback on what Erin's saying, I have long thought that, uh, and I think I shared this, but um, the 
that we could do a better job of sharing stories mm -hmm. in the congregation. You know, oftentimes we see each other for six minutes <laughs> between this and that, and oh, hi, hi, how are you doing? Oh, the weather, oh, the this, the kids, whatever. And it's kind of superficial, mm -hmm. but if we took a moment, maybe you know, every, even every service, to have somebody stand up and tell a five minute story about themselves, mm -hmm. um, it would be super impactful. I know when we didn't, when we, were without pews and we were in chairs and we did like a turn and talk mm -hmm. to people like in the back pew it was awesome yeah. to like have that quick conversation and i think it was it was like six minutes but like all of a sudden it was like oh wow you sit right behind me every single sunday and mm -hmm. i didn't know this that and the other thing about you mm -hmm. and um the quote that i was, always resonates with me is um the shortest distance between two people is a story. Mm -hmm. And I just think if we had more opportunity, you know, and again, we're smushing this into like an hour, an hour time frame, and we only have nine more minutes. But um, you know, like what a great opportunity to to branch off of this and have more opportunities to to share stories and to connect because we are, we are still multi-dimensional. Um many of you have known for many years, excuse me. And yet there's so much that I don't know about you and you don't know about me. And so I don't know. I just think this could be a really cool one. Mm -hmm. I would say like even just have a whole month of adult forum where we could <laughs> just do that. that. That would be interesting. My parents just moved into a retirement and once a week they have a uh, activity on their calendar where people come and just tell their story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that this little community can together and just like, what did Pastor L say two weeks ago? Something about like what keeps you up at night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, and the other thing I took away was if it doesn't have food, it could have been an email. Quarterly dinners where we just like right. get back to the whole like let's, yeah. let's just sit together and like you could have some conversation starters mm -hmm. on the table for people yeah. who feel are a little bit introverted or feel like they're not sure where to start, but to just talk to one another about what we all find important and That's like let that lead sort of how we continue to get back to those yeah. old fashioned potluck supper. Potluck dinners, yeah. I mean, bloopers were on in something all those years. That's Claire, like, I saw your hand up. Sorry. Kind of segue on what you said. Um, to get your hand up, sorry. Um, to get to include the community, if you have like a chicken barbecue mm -hmm. or something like that, where not only are we there, but the community could be invited to come. I mean, it would plus money or something, but still, uh, I've seen this in other, Churches is in the non denominational churches mm -hmm. a lot where they have community events and they invite the community and they go around and they talk to people about mm -hmm. what, what their church is about and, mm -hmm. and are, are friendly to the community and welcoming to the community. And it really does, if you're looking to widen, it, it brings people in because you're being very welcoming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it forces you out of your comfort zone. Yeah. <laughs> They're scared of who they might get. <laughs> I'd say especially like white suburban Lutherans. <laughs> Not to call literally all of us out. Um, but you know. Um you actually have to welcome people. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So this conversation continues, like all the conversations we've been having, but um that area one of our strategic plan that if you're not familiar or you need to refresh your memory is posted in the narthex is all about widening our welcome. And RIC is um, a part of that and anti-racism work is a part of that, but also just generally, how do we become a more intentionally welcoming community? And how can we communicate that to the wider community? Yeah. How can we get that out? Yeah. So that um, people know who we are. Yeah. My neighbor was telling me, she couldn't think of the name of RIC, but she knew her church was an RIC church, but she couldn't think of it, but she was trying to explain it to yeah. me. And when she was explaining it to me, I said, are you an RIC church? And she said, yes! <laughs> yes. Yeah. And so that's what we're trying to do. And yeah. trying to let the community know that we're not. Exactly. So I think that's something we need to really focus on is how to let the whole community know what's up. Like the, the dinners here are fabulous for us already, but how do we make that something that other people think. Yeah, so just in the last couple of minutes, who's missing? What are we missing? What have we, what has been left out of this conversation so far? Are there 
identity categories or structural inequalities that we've missed in this conversation? Um, are we missing out on opportunities to think more intersectionally that you've noticed? We have we have not addressed how early we need to be encouraging that so children, mm. you know, uh, within the congregation, mm -hmm. the, the Sunday school program or whatever, to have that component there. And I'm not saying that they don't do a fabulous job, mm -hmm. not at all, but to intentionally have that as a component. So that as they live and grow in this house of God, it will just be further acknowledged and reinforced so that by the time we confirm or maybe marry you or baptize your babies, mm -hmm. uh, this is just who we so are. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, Alex. I've, I've been advocating for uh, having the youth as part of this discussion. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, and, I, and I also wanted to say something about sameness and difference mm -hmm. because we so often highlight them. And I wonder how to do it for you too. They shouldn't highlight them. <laughs> any other any other final thoughts on that so like i said these conversations continue you can always come talk to me to any member of the rif your advocacy teams um to pastor keith um if you have thoughts suggestions questions um I'm sure Dottie would also take your thoughts, suggestions, and questions. Um, so this is the end of this series, but not the end of this conversation. We are very consciously talking about widening our welcome. It's in the strategic plan, um, and we want to continue doing better and growing into it. Um, and one of the ways that you can do that as individuals and that we can continue to do that as a community is by um, following up on these advocacy opportunities that you have on the sheets in front of you. Um, so there are national, state, and local opportunities um, to pursue intersectional justice um, listed on this sheet. And then at the bottom, there are a couple of sort of educational or informational resources if you want to dig into this more, especially um, in terms of local activism. Um, and I know Erin knows more about local and state opportunities um, if you really get excited about that. Um, I know. Keith and Jenny also are very plugged into some of that stuff. If you want to talk to them, Jenny's not here today. She's coming back from visiting their daughter in Canada. Um, but um, yes. I just have a question for everyone. Yeah. If you are interested in advocacy, Absolutely. is the advocacy team a team yeah. that you can join? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, yes. And if you're interested in our, doing more with RIC, are we at the point where we're asking people if we want to join in being a part of the RIC committee? Or are we going to, is that a little bit later? I don't know that um, the core team, Fred, can you hear us? I think the goal is to transition. Yeah. To a yeah. welcoming right. yeah. committee. Yeah. So, yeah. so and that will be June. I that's up here. Just, Just so people know. Yes. Fred yes. is trying to answer. Yes. Fred, please fill us in on that. Yes, I think uh, the RIC team eventually will transition to a broader welcoming task force. I think that's in our plan probably in the next few months. So we still have more work to do. Right. And the uh, educational series was a big part of that. But eventually there'll be an opportunity, I think, for people to join in the welcome that we wish to uh, proclaim and expand uh, in the very near future. Awesome. I'm hoping, like, as Elle said, like, that's something that's keeping some people up at night. They yeah. Gotta come and join them. Yeah. The advocacy team will meet on March 13th after the second service. So everyone is welcome. If it's a small group, we're in Patrick Keith's office. If it's a big group, we'll be in here. So I hope we're in here. Please join us because yeah. your voice is And before welcome. you all leave, we need to know what a gift this month has been for us and the hard, hard work that went into it by these folks. Yeah, thank you for giving us your People who have lives elsewhere, and yet they are still uh, invested.
and time wise and skill sets and to, to doing this for us. So it's a beautiful, beautiful testimony to who they are and where we are going. Don't lose sight of where we are going. That, yeah, we are going to the glory land. <laughs> <laughs>